people late. That's okay. Uh, we know how that works. Um, and and, and we're, we're just happy that you're here and we want you here safe and we want to be a blessing to our neighbors as well. Um, so I know that's your heart and that's my heart and I thought I'd just bring it up so we can all be reminded. I want to encourage you about a couple other announcements as well. We have voter registration in the back and we know that uh, we're in the midst of an election uh, year and it's a serious election and we want to let you know that um, that as Christians we believe that a vote is a stewardship and that the opportunity to cast your conscience um, to the direction of our country is absolutely essential to us. And we want to be a blessing and a help in that way. Um, if you're not registered to vote, I think we can help you to do that. And if you are, we want to encourage you to get out there and vote your values and vote your conscience. And it's something really important that we believe uh, that even though uh, Christianity, I look for a different city, I don't know if you know that, but um, the country that I'm going to someday be a part of, his builder and maker is going to be God, right? And I'm excited about that. But we want to just encourage you. Um, I know that this can be very, politics can be very complicated and people can feel suppressed. And I just want to say right away that if you're a believer and you have values, we are obviously, uh, we'll, we'll go back and forth as Christians and as non-Christians, just people talking about uh, what we believe and trying to convince other people. But we're saying this as a church, we say you cannot allow this stewardship, this opportunity to pass by. So I encourage you, make your voice heard, make it known um, so that uh, we can see um, our country reflect our values, and that's a stewardship. We believe in that. We believe it's important, so don't, don't let that pass you by. If you need help with that, um, we have uh, done a ton of study. i got some great websites where you can just see what these ballot measures even mean. Anybody here read a ballot measure and say, what in the world is that talking about? I read one, I had to read it two or three times and multiple opinions because yes means no and no means yes. And there's, if you have questions, I know that we have had, uh, there's some great uh, opportunities. I think Salt and Light Ministries has a great website with a multitude of informational opportunities for Christians to see how these um, different ballots, what they mean and how they can reflect your values. And so we encourage you to go um, and uh, to vote and to be equipped in that way because it's a sacred trust. Have we dismissed the children already? All right, I see a few here. Good, they get to get an adult message. Are you in Second Chronicles chapter number 29? Do you even know where Second Chronicles is? This is a challenging book. It's a, uh, if you look back, uh, the middle of the book of the Bible, if you open your Bible with a dead center, just about any Bible, you'll hit Psalms. And so you can go ahead and do that. And you go back a little ways from the book of Psalms, you go through some little books, and then you'll hit Second Chronicles, chapter number 29, um, and we're going to begin this morning here. All right, Second Chronicles 29. Don't forget, we have a business meeting on Wednesday night. For those of you that are members, we've placed our bylaws, the changes that we've made there, and those are reflected in a long form and a short form. Also, we're, we're going to vote to confirm our budget and our ministry coming up in the future. So if you're, again, if you're going to get involved in that, we have some packets here. If one's missing, let me know. We'll make sure we get that to you. Um, we're voting on our officers for the year. We're voting on our uh, budget for the year and on missions, uh, missionaries that we're going to take on to do the work of the gospel all over the world, helping in third world countries and such. And so we'd like you to be involved in that. We need this week, in order to ratify our bylaw changes, we need, a, we need a two-thirds of the membership. So if you're a member, this is an absolute must. We need you there at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. It was really important um, to the furtherance of the ministry and the church there, and that would be a great blessing. If you could clear your schedule, we'd certainly appreciate it. And this happens every year, um, the second week. But starting next year, it will be the third week of October, and we'll do this so that we can prepare for the next year. And we're super excited. Almost $20,000 going to the mission field um, uh, this year. We're looking forward to that, and we're excited about taking on 7 to 14 new missionaries as well as just increasing the ministry in a lot of ways. So praise the Lord for that. And let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 29 because this is what you've all been here for and you've been waiting for. And as we come to the book of Second Chronicles chapter number 29, we're going to focus on verse 10 and 11, but I'm going to start in chapter number 1. I want to talk about what's going on. Many of you know that um, the Jews uh, once lived in a place called Palestine and Jerusalem, and they had a country. And, uh, and in those days, there were, there were a great deal of hardships. They, there was a huge civil war that had been ongoing for many years. They broke up into two essential, essentially two countries. Uh, you know, uh, we know what a civil war is, only we maintained um, our unity, and they did not. So the states broke up. 
and uh, they ended up in a kind of uh, certain issues. The, one of the nations has now been attacked by Assyria, which is a northern uh, country, and they, they basically took away, uh, hauled into captivity everyone. Uh, so there's not much left in the way the Israelites uh, come in close to this time. They're all going to be carried away. And the, the southern kingdom has just been ruled by an absolutely horrible king, a horrible leader. He's done a multitude of very uh, wicked things, including like child sacrifice. And he worshipped every god of the sun. And he capitulated to, uh, you know, he funded uh, terrorism in his own area, which is crazy because it's unbelievable to see how like today their day and age was. But when we come to Hezekiah in chapter 29, a really bad guy has just passed away, the leader. And this was a monarchy, so he was a king, and he had almost absolute power. And so when he passed away, his son Hezekiah came to reign. At this time, the, the capital city's walls have been uh, decimated. The, over 200,000 slaves were carried away with spoil. Some of them were sent back home. Because God moved in the hearts of those that attacked them, and they felt bad about it, and they sent their, some of their slaves back home. But just, you can imagine the hardship they'd gone through. They lost 120,000 people in battle during the previous king's reign. And so they were a decimated country. They were in debt. They were uh, without protection. And again, those days, it was a dog-eat-dog world, right? It's not like today. Uh, there wasn't some... A uh, big country kind of watching over what's going on. There was just a, these guys were out there all on their own. And the Bible's clear they had only God for their protector. Only God for their protector. It's really unbelievable and even miraculous if you look at the Bible and you see how big the country of Israel is now and even was then. It's really miraculous that they were ever a world power, but they were during the time of Solomon. And. What happened ultimately is when they depended on God, they did well, and when they didn't, they did bad. And that's just a blatant and true fact of Israel. They recorded the history. If they followed the Lord, they did really good, and if they didn't, they did really bad. And it's a reminder that no matter how big your country is, no matter how great uh, your treasury or your army is, and uh, you need God. Every family, every community, every person, every government needs the Lord and his blessings to succeed. And they recognize that. Even pagan kings, both Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, who ruled the one world government at that time and conquered all of the known world, said, we could not have done this without God. Nietzsche, a king of Egypt, also acknowledged Jehovah, that God. In those days, God was so renowned, that is, the God of the Bible was so renowned, that even pagan kings recognized his power. And so Hezekiah looked around at his culture, at his people, and they were being destroyed. And he said, we've got to change. We've got to change our lives. We've got to change our nation. We've got to change our churches. And that's what he did. And, I'm, and I, I, some of you are here on Wednesday night, and you've heard part of this introduction of the message, and I'm kind of bringing that series into Sunday morning, the life of Hezekiah and his reign and revival. And that's what we're really talking about, a roadmap for revival or new life in a church, in a community. I want to say this because we don't often think about it. Anybody ever say something like this? Every politician is corrupt. This country's going down the tubes. Have you ever said something like that? Maybe you've even said this to yourself, if not somebody else. We cannot change this. We cannot turn this around. Have you ever heard that? I'm here to tell you today that if, you, as, if we as a country would turn back to the God of the Bible, we could see a miraculous change in our country. And this happened in the days of Hezekiah. They thought, we could never change, man. Everybody hates us. Everybody's attacking us. Huge armies. We got no, they had no armies left. All their great men of valor, their generals, they'd all been killed. These guys are, they're just, they're the offscoring. They're kind of like a, a byline in, in the culture. I mean, these guys, they're, they're, they're a third world country essentially at this point. But Hezekiah said, we can't live like this anymore. We need help. And he turned the country back to God in a matter of one chapter. Hezekiah's nation went from like child sacrifice to success on the not only in their own personal lives and protection, but on the world stage. It became something significant for God. I'm telling you this, no matter how bad your church is if you're visiting here today, because obviously our church is great, right? No matter how bad your life is and your family is, the Bible says if you could turn to God, you could see miraculous things happen. And that's what Hezekiah did. Essentially, in a matter of one year, he changed his whole nation. 
And as we talked about that roadmap to revival, last week we talked about um, just reviving our, our, our faith in the Lord and, and the, the necessity for God to be a part of our lives. This week I want to talk about something I think is super important. That Christians today, that people that are seeking to be worshipers of God absolutely have to do. And that is we have to revive devotion to the Lord. We've got to revive a devotion to the Lord in our country and our churches. I want to speak today about something that has happened, something horrible, and that is we have become a me-centric society. I'd go so far to say this. Even in America today, the church has become a me-centric church. I'm not just talking about us. I'm just talking about it happens. I mean, you just look around. I want to, let's, let's open up the Bible here. In verse number nine. It says, for lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity for this because they rejected the Lord. But look what it says. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord, a promise, a contract with God, that his fierce fierce wrath may turn away from us because God does. Wrath is a part of God's person. He's a person. He doesn't not get angry. He does, just like people do. It's a very righteous anger. It's a very true anger. It's a very careful anger. And just anger, but it says he does. Verse number 11 says this, My sons, be not now negligent. For the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and to serve him that you should minister unto him and burn incense. And this is what I want to talk about today. I'm talking about reviving the church's devotion to God. How many ever heard... The term personal devotions. Anybody here ever heard that term? It's what Christians used to clarify. It's when we used to talk about open up our Bible in the morning, you know, and reading our Bible and praying. We called those devotions. And so we have a tendency in our day and age to kind of kind of say words, right? And and you know, utilize them for specific like urban uses, but not to recognize what the Bible's talking about. I'm talking about Reviving a devotion to God, reviving a Christ-centric, a Jesus-centric, a God-centric mentality among believers. I believe one of the first steps that our nation needs to take in the right direction is that Christians, not the world, they need to change too, but that Christians need to start by honoring their own belief system, by making Christ the center of their worship. Let's begin with, I believe, the, what we're talking about here is three absolutely essential qualities, absolutely essential um, um, principles, and we talk about reviving our devotion to the Lord. Reviving our devotion to the Lord. Number one, I want to talk about this, the divine prerogative. The divine prerogative. When I say a big word like that, what I mean is this, God gets to choose. See, What's happening in our lives, I believe, a lot of times is that we do what's right and wrong based on how it benefits us. Anybody here? When you first came to God, you were like, okay, God's offering salvation. He's got to forgive my sins. That's a pretty good deal for me. You come to church like, man, there's some nice people. I got some friends. You know, we're not all locked in our house during COVID because we get to go to church. We get to see human beings. Check. That's a positive for me. Or maybe a negative, I don't know how you stand. But we tend to come to God with a very personal, with a very me, uh, you know, idea. Some of us will will go to churches, we'll pick our churches, and we'll be like, well, I don't like this church, and I do like that church. This one does, has things that I want, and this one has things that I don't want. Do you ever say a word like this when you're worshiping the Lord? You're like, I don't like that song. Or how about this? I do like that song. See, this is a really common thing in Christianity, and I think it's so natural, is that we have a tendency to forget why we're here. Do you know, we don't get up in the morning and put our best clothes on and, and drive halfway across the community. Some of you came 40 minutes to get here. The bulk of us commute to get to this church, so you know you got to really want to go, right? And then we don't stand up and sing and do something absolutely uncomfortable. Because let's face it, how many of you sing randomly in public? Raise your hand if you're a random public singer. Anybody? Raise your hand if there's no way you will ever do that. 
Or if, how about if you're so scared you don't want to raise your hand because even that's too public, right? You get up and you're singing in front of people, right? And you're like, we don't do that because you don't do this stuff, right? For you. We do it for God. But you know, there's a troubling trend, not just in our day, but it's all, something that's always happened, is that we start coming for the Lord and over time, we, we start coming for different reasons for ourselves. Do you ever walk into a group of people and you're like, there's nothing here that I like, so I don't want to be here. And I actually think this happens even in personal devotions. People sit down, they open up their Bible to read. How many ever read your Bible and you got nothing? Anybody here? That's right. See, some of our most seasoned Christians do that too. So if you're a brand new Christian, you're like, I read it and I didn't get anything. That does happen. How many of you ever sat down to pray and you felt like your prayers hit the ceiling and it bounced back? And you were talking to yourself. See, what we've lost so often in our day and age is that we don't always have to get, we're always asking, did we get a bang for our buck? Did we get, is it worth it? Do you ever sit down and read the Bible and say, you know what, it's not doing anything for me, so I'm not doing it. This is happening in our culture today. We are, we are starting to pick and choose when it comes to worship what's good and bad, not based on what God said, not based on the fact that we're God's servants, not based, based on the fact that he's, that he's divine, but we're basing it on our own personal wants and desires. And that's a dangerous place to be. I was listening, I, I listen to the news, you've seen the election, and you've seen all the stuff going on in our culture, not just with the presidency, but with everything. And we're like, and people are all asking, well, who gets to decide what's right and wrong? And I wanna, I'm here to tell you today, the church believes that God gets to decide. That he has a divine, he's God. He created the world, the heaven and the earth. They are his. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool, the Bible says. In other words, God gets to choose. The, the truth is that when you come to God in Christianity, you have to understand this. Look what it says in the Bible here. It says, my sons, don't be negligent. Because negligence ha is happening today. It can happen to your life. It may have happened to you. I don't know where you're at personally. But you might be dealing with a kind of negligence or neglect of your faith. Because you forgot this one concept here. It says, for the Lord has what? He's chosen you. What? You mean, how many of you came to God and you thought you chose the Lord? <laughs> this is a crazy thing. People come to me all the time. They're like, I, I'm not buying that Christian stuff. And I always, I always chuckle because how many people in the Bible, how many of us said, God isn't going to tell me what to do. I'll choose what I want. The Bible says this, God chose you. Amen. I'm going to tell you a real concept that we teach in Christianity, that God is the primary and the preceding actor in every salvation, in every person that accepts Jesus. The Bible says God sought them first. Romans 3.10 says this, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Right? I mean, it says there is none good. We're all gone out of the way. We all become, un everybody goes his own way. But see, God says, I choose you. There's a story about a man named Paul right in the Bible, and he's riding on a donkey to persecute Christians because he's sick and tired of them trying to change his religion. And God shines a light out of heaven and makes him blind. And he falls the road and he says, whoa, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus. Tell me, Paul, is it hard? Is it hard to kick against me, to kick against these pricks, to fight this, this, this pressure I'm putting on you? And basically, Paul just, changed, he just gave his life up to the Lord. And I'm here to tell you today, nobody comes to Jesus unless Jesus first came to them. Now that might just be situational, it might be God moving in a spiritual way that you didn't even recognize, God might be lining up events, but God is seeking people to serve him. Now, just because God chose you doesn't mean that you don't choose him. I mean, we've, I'll give you a great example. How about Judas Iscariot? You know what Jesus said? He says, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? That's what he said. So, gee, so God can come after you, God could seek you, and you could be like, oh. The point I'm making here is this. God always acts first. 
He's seeking every person in this world. Jesus said, if I'm the Son of Man, if I be lifted up on that cross, he said, I will draw everyone to myself. And ultimately, this is what we've got to remember. God is first. Who gets to decide what kind of relationships are okay? How dare somebody tell me how to run my finances? Who gets to say where I get to be on Sunday? I'm here to tell you. God does. Now, God's not superimposing his will on you and dragging you to church every Sunday. Boy, that'd be fun, something funny, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be funny if the hand of God reached out on Sunday and drug us all here? The, all random people that hated God just got drugged into church. by. He doesn't do that. He's not overriding free will. But what he's saying is this, is that God, his, he's, he gets to choose. Now, he said you get this whole life to decide whether you want me or you don't want me. Whether you want the, the wonder of being with me for all of eternity or whether you want to be all by yourself. Away from my love and light and the opportunity to connect to this world, you choose. God said that. And he's allowing that today. But no matter uh, what the commentators, no matter what the psychologists, no matter what even the churches are randomly saying about God, guess what? His word is the absolute truth because he has the divine prerogative. I'm here to say no man gets to choose what's right and wrong. God chose. And for my money, Christians have done a little bit too much trying to show people why, you know, doing godly things is a good idea. And they've done too little of just saying, look, we're all going to answer to God. You know, we're gonna, you're going to have to, one day you're going to have to decide who's ruling, who's the boss. See, we've got to come to grips with the fact that God has the divine prerogative. Not only in our lives, not only in our fate, but ultimately this in our worship, that I, you, we've got to decide that we're coming to church because that's what God said we should do. Amen. we got to decide that we open the Bible and read it on a daily basis. We open up, we're going to pray to God on a regular basis. we gotta, we got to decide to do that, not because it's good for us, which, by the way, it is, but because God said, I've chosen you to do this. See, the Levites, they were in the freedom, they were in the American way. They were like, hey, we were all chosen to do the work of the temple. We just decided we don't want to. We're going to do our own thing. And God says, look, you don't understand. I chose you. That means that as believers, now look, I'm not trying to superimpose my will on you. I'm just trying to remind everyone here today that God has a divine prerogative. And then, well, why should God get to tell me? <laughs> because he created you. The scriptures teach us that we're all under God's authority because we are all products of God's divine creation. Why should I follow Jesus? Because the Bible said that Christ is the creator of this world. This is why God gets to speak into our lives. So when I come to church, guess what? If I get nothing, that's okay. You know, I had to come to grips with this a long time ago. Those, when you're a new Christian man, you're so pumped. When you're a new pastor, you're so pumped. When you teach your first class, you're so pumped. When you do your first ministry, you're so excited. You know what happens after 30 years of doing that stuff? I'll just tell you, it is not all sunshine and roses. Sometimes I'm in there cleaning those toilets and I'm saying, this is not fun. God, should I be doing this if it doesn't make me joyful, excited? Look, the reality is this. Christians, if you start coming to church one day and you realize that it's not all emotionally exciting, you got to acknowledge something that's a reality here. I didn't come for me. I came for God. You shouldn't come for you. Oh, I'll just tell you this. If you do come, God will help you. I mean, it's a great thing. How many of you know that God's truth changed your life and good things come from that? But every time you come to church, you won't be blessed. The hashtag kind of blessed, right? The kind of blessed that means money and stuff and fun and exciting things. Sometimes you're going to serve the Lord and there will be nothing. Crickets. Silence. Discouragement. How many times you think, how many times you think in, in 40 years some faithful preacher that we've seen of the past didn't get up in the morning and say, man, I don't want to do this anymore. How many times do you think he said that? It probably happened. The truth is, is that we don't do this for us. We do it for God. And Hezekiah, he was trying to teach the Levites, look, what the problem here is is that we've forgotten that God is God. 
Not me as God. I don't get to decide where, the, where I go to the temple. I don't get to decide who God is or what he looks like or what his, what his truths and realities are in my life. He is God. And we've got to accept that. There's a reality that we are not able to control our own fate, the outcome of our own lives, that I can't work hard enough to always just be successful, that I need God. Jesus said in John 15, 16, turn to the book of John 15, 16, we'll read a couple verses from this passage. God chose you. God is the primary actor. He was the first actor in your salvation. He will continue to be the most important person in every spiritual transaction. That's right, you sit down to pray. Well, I didn't get anything. He didn't answer me. Wait a minute. Why were you praying? See, we, see, we don't understand this. We go back, let's go back 2,000 years to a country of slaves. And we'll talk about what it means to follow somebody. To a country with monarchs. See, we don't understand this because we're people of freedom. We understand that even though I believe people should be free from the governmental control that's totalitarian, I don't believe we're ever free from God's truth and reality and his control in our lives. He says in John 15, 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever you will ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Verse number 19, turn just three verses later. If you are of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, and but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, again, God, God spoke into our lives. Peter and, and, and his brother, they were out there mending their nets, and Jesus walked up and he said, follow me. Now, Jesus chose them, didn't he? And then they responded. They dropped their nets and they followed God. I'm not saying that you're absolved of any responsibility to respond to God. The point I'm making is this. Remember that we are at God's bidding and not God at ours. I'm going to go so far as to say this. It's probably better for Christians when they pray to God for Him not to give them what they ask for than to give them what they ask for. I would say, everybody ever say, I've been asking God for this for a long time and he keeps saying no. Anybody here? I'm going to say this. I'm glad God tells me no sometimes. You know why? Because it reminds me that I'm not number one. That there is a divine prerogative. And a no in many cases can be much more valuable to a Christian than a yes. Now we don't like that. I want, I want yes and yes. I want the commandments of the Lord to be yes and yes and not no and no. I want what I want. I want God to give me that. But look at this. If you come to God because of what you can get, i got to ask myself, have you really come to God? Or at least we all start that way. But if it doesn't, we don't come to a realization that we're coming because he's the Lord, because we need something more than ourselves. Are we, are we really coming all the way? See, God's got to become number one in our lives. He said, see, God has chosen you to stand before him. That's right. You, you know what I encourage you to do? Show up. Show up for your personal devotions in the morning when you read your Bible. Show up for your prayer time with the Lord on a daily basis. Show up to the church for worship. Show up to serve others. See, God has chosen you to stand. And many times that's all you'll do. Pastor will say stand, and you're saying the words, and your heart's not always in it, and it doesn't always work exactly like you want, and the songs don't always reflect you, and the pastor definitely doesn't always say what you want him to say. And I could be honest, right? A lot of you fall asleep, which means it's not always just really hitting home, right? And the truth is, though, there is a redeemable quality in just showing up. There is. There is. And if you don't realize the value of it, let me turn to a modern cultural reality. Do you know in room 41 of London's Natural Portrait Gallery, you can go to see a one meter, that is a three foot wide plasma screen, showing a 67 minute video of David Beckham asleep. That's right. The art gallery commissioned a 67 minute of David Beckham sleeping. How many of you think our culture, we worship something, right? We worship something. Worship ourselves. 
We worship our celebrities. God's here to tell you, hey, guess what? Gwyneth Paltrow doesn't get to decide what's right and wrong. I mean, let's be honest. These rappers, I don't know. How in the world is Kanye West an authority on politics? I'm just, I'm just asking. I mean, even though it seems like lately he's been agreeing with me more and more. The truth is, is that our culture is deciding what's right and wrong based on what our community of peers or, or people that we appreciate believe. But God says this, I get to decide what you do with your life. I get to decide what's best for you. I get to decide what the family looks like. There's a divine prerogative. And Christians need to decide that, hey, I don't come to church for me. i got to come for God. Because it's a form of worship, just showing up, just being in my place. He's chosen me to stand here today. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, God chose you to be available at certain times for him on a regular basis, whether personally or corporately as a group. Number two, he has a divine prerogative. Number two, he has a determined priesthood. A determined priesthood. I want you guys, this is crazy. I read this today and it was like revelation. I've been studying the Bible most of my life, but this shocked me. Do you know what the word for worship is also translated as? The word is menial. Menial. That's right. The word here, now again, there's other words for worship too, but in this passage here, look what it says. He says, I have chosen you to stand before him, and the next words here are what? Are to serve him. This is also translated other places as worship him. And the word here means menial, to contribute to, to wait upon. How many of you ever said, why am I doing this? It seems so trite. I'll never forget, many, many years ago, we were having days of work days, right? We built, you guys see this church here, it's so beautiful. Do you know this is like a product of the love of many people over so many years? Men and women and kids with hammers and nails and teenagers did, did a, like a huge bulk of the roof work up there. Can you believe that? I don't even know what we would do. Nowadays, I would not allow it because of insurance, you know. But you, this whole church is just built with people every day just showing up. Doing to me. And I'll never forget, years and years ago, a really wealthy guy was like, I can't show up. I'm way too important where I'm at. Now, that really, how many of you remember that? It was, it was like super bothersome to a lot of us. We were like, whoa, you mean you can't do manual stuff for God? And actually, now though, looking, getting, growing up and looking back, I understand how he feels. I understand how he feels. But there was a flaw in the reasoning. That is that for a Christian to serve the Lord, God calls us to be menial, to be low before him. So that, I'll be honest, a lot of the things in the church will seem like they're below your pay grade. Matter of fact, I almost promise you if you're anybody of any significance at your job or in your whatever sphere of influence, you are going to come to church and be like, are you kidding me? Vacuuming? Are you kidding me? Like, like, I'm a big wig. I don't be doing this stuff. Where I go, they respect me. I'm going to tell you right now, did you know that so many of the things we do for God, they are menial? Because when we're in the world, we might be the boss. But when we're in the Lord, we're the servant. We're the servant. You know, every Christian has to be willing to come down before the Lord. Hey, you could run the biggest company in America. You could be the richest billionaire in the world. You could be the best at what you do. But when you come before God, guess what? You're menial. Hey, man, God, look, I'm going to tell you right now, and, and I believe this. I believe that a CEO of a Fortune 500 company should not feel like he's stooping to clean God's toilets. I believe that. And if you don't believe that, how many ever of the two-minute rule or two-second rule? Anybody? There's, there's a famous guy that goes around and travels to companies all over the world and teaches them how to be efficient. Yes, and he has CEOs that pay big time, like hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to get his training. And he brings these big companies, big companies, bring these guys in from Fortune 500 companies to his offices. You know what the first thing he has them do is? Clean the bathrooms. Is that crazy? How many of you think that guy's a Christian? You would be right. I'm pretty sure he is. I don't know. It's definitely a Christian ethic, isn't it? 
Because he says what happens so often is we don't realize the value of serving. God tells us this. When you come before God, many of the things he asks you to do will seem below your pay grade. But when we come before God, we're servants. That's right. I don't have to come and be number one. I don't have to come and look at my menial task as low. I don't have to come and pray or read the Bible. I don't get anything. I guess I'll just quit now because it's not good enough for me because it's not exciting. We'll stop. See what we've done. To have true revival in life, Christians have to reestablish the lordship of Jesus in their lives. I'm a servant. I'm a servant. See, worship is when a, a person comes down off their high human interest to serve God. I think this is really important. This is a really important reality. The word here, this, when he says, is to attend as a menial or a worshiper. That's right. God says, you better humble yourself because I'm God. We see the, deri- the divine prerogative. And look at this, Romans 1, 1, Paul. Do you know what the Apostle Paul, the Bible says, actually sent his handkerchiefs? And people would touch those handkerchiefs and be healed. The Apostle Paul did miracles in God's name. He knew three languages. And essentially he led the Gentile revival in church. You know, what he, you know how he started his books? Romans 1, 1. Paul, a slave, a servant of Jesus Christ. See, everybody's got to come down before God. Everybody's got to come down before God. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not such a bad thing. Luke 15, 17, the, remember the prodigal son? He's out there and he's like in the world and he's doing his thing, right? And he's, he's living high on the hog. He runs out of cash and next thing you know, he's feeding the pigs, remember? And the Bible said that he, he tried to fill his stomach with, you know, old corn husks. Or old, you know, just the, just the, the cellulose off of these the offscoring of the vegetables, and he was trying to fill himself with pig food. And this is what he said. Watch what he says in verse 15, chapter 15, verse number 17. He said, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish for hunger. Luke 15, 17 teaches a valuable reality that if you cannot come be a servant of God, you will never be satisfied with your life. You'll never be satisfied with your life. You've got to become a servant of the Lord. And he recognized that even though, that even being a slave in his dad's house was better than being the big wig in the world because he ran out of money, he ran out of clout, he ran out of friends, and then he was doing what? He was eating with the pigs. And I'm telling you right now, I have a lot of pigs. That's not the best thing to eat. The goats, they got standards. The cows, they got standard sheep. They are picky. The pigs, they eat anything. Right? As a matter of fact, you've got to be careful what you feed them. But I'm guessing in a culture where people were starving, the pigs weren't getting great stuff. And here's what happens, though. Now, I'm not asking you to be starving. I'm saying that's what the world offers. It offers emptiness. And if you think that stooping, that coming beneath God, that showing your worship, showing your devotion to the Lord by putting him first is too small for you then you're missing the point God says you got to come under you got to come under so show up serve the Lord lastly we've seen first of all the divine prerogative God's number one the determined priesthood that is that we get we this is our job it might seem menial but God chose us to this and we've got to follow and we we can't expect to always be self-satisfied John 4, 23 said this, but the hour comes and even now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeks such to worship Him. See, 4, 24 says this, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in what? In spirit and in truth. That's right. You mean that. You know, even if I don't like a song, it could still be worship. Because it's not our goal to pick songs you don't like. It's not our goal to be a church that everybody hates. It's not my goal to be boring, believe it or not. The truth is, though, is that you will often stand in the presence of God. You will often serve in the service of God. 
And you'll be like, where is it? Where is it? Where's the X factor? Where's the pizzazz? That's not important. You're a worshiper. Worshippers do the menial, meaning, meaning, menial tasks. I, and I know that's hard. You know, I, I read C.H. Spurgeon says this famous preacher. I love, I love his messages and I listen to him often. He said, it needs more skill than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. And that can be hard sometimes. Submission is a difficult thing. It's difficult to be second, to let God make your decisions. But I'm just here to tell you that the prodigal son and so many have learned that it's better to be a servant in the house of God than a free man in the house of worldliness. And, and let's, let's move on here, though. The devoted presence of his worshipers. The devoted presence. I want to show you this next one. He says, as we go to uh, 2 Chronicles, verse number 11, uh, chapter 29 here, he says, My sons, be not negligent. Don't let this negligence seep into your life, into your worship. For the Lord has chosen you to stand before Him and to serve Him. And lastly, that you should minister unto Him. This is my final point. I'm going to close with this reality. That, and it is crazy because the word menial here is actually coupled with another word to change from serve to minister. The word word here is to exist before Him. To exist. It comes from the word to breathe. So they took this service, this menial service, and they just said, look, it's enough to just be where God wants you to be. I want to remind you of this. You can open the Bible and get nothing, and God is still honored. You can share the gospel, and they don't get saved, and God is still honored. You come to church and not feel like some radical second blessing, and God is still honored. The Christians, we got to stop thinking about this in the way that it serves us and start thinking about it in the way that it serves Him. You want a pattern of this. In these days in Jerusalem, they, would, they had a temple where was God's house, and every morning and every day, all day long, at certain times, there was singing before that. Do you know that there were singers that literally like 24, like for the full 12 hours of the daytime would just sing all day in the temple? Just singing, just singing. It's like, does that seem like a waste of time, anybody? How many of you think it was just awesome to be that dude? Like, 12 hours, I'm singing still. Why is God listening to me? Why are we doing this? It seems like a waste of time. But they taught us a valuable lesson, didn't they? As the, as the smoke continually rose before God's presence. It was a symbol of the fact that Christians are supposed to present themselves on a consistent basis before God, to live in the light of His presence, to honor Him, not for us, for Him. How many of you think He went to, they went to one day they went to this bland little showbread, unleavened wafer thingy and they'd eat it every single day as a high priest? How many of you think they were really excited about that? They got to make all 12 of these loaves, and every day they got to eat all the doggone things. How many of you would be excited about a meal? You eat the same meal every single day. Well, that must, have been, that must have been tough, and I certainly understand why they didn't like it. But let's remember this. Who were they ministering to? Themselves? To God. See, God was teaching that culture. He was teaching us, in essence, that worship is not about us. It's about God. That's right. If all you did was show up, God is honored. If you go through the motions and you don't feel anything, God is glorified. And it's a requirement to who he is. Now i got to say, don't worship for yourself. Otherwise, you'll show up to church one day and it won't meet your expectations and then you'll hate it. Because you thought it was for you and you didn't get what you wanted. We're not God, you know. And we like to think so sometimes. You guys know the famous story of Muhammad Ali, right? He, he put it in his book. Um, the soul of a butterfly. He was a famous boaster, right? You guys know <laughs> Muhammad Ali, uh, he had something with Trump, I think. But there's a, every, just boasting about himself. He's always saying how awesome he was, right? It was part of his like, thing to get into his enemy's psyche. And one day he was on a plane and the stewardess came up and she says, she said, uh, excuse me, Mr. Ali, you need to put your seatbelt on. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she said, well, Superman doesn't need a plane either. <laughs> and that, wasn't that a great way... You know, and that impacted him so much he put it in his book. And it's a reminder, isn't it? Isn't it a reminder? We think it's all about us. We've got to get away. Christians, beware of the me-centric society. Revival in our nation, revival in our church, revival in our lives starts. It's not about me. It doesn't have to be about me. If I get nothing, 
at, from church. It's okay. I, you will, by the way. You will get something. You won't always get something. It won't always come when you expect it. It won't always be the way you like it. But you, but you didn't come here for that. You came here for God. You came here for the Lord. Don't forget that. Don't lose that. You're not going to have the kind of new life, new kind of you know, transformative stuff if you just think, if you just think you're the man. You, you, it's about God. It's about God. And with that, I just want to close with this reading here from the passage. It says, My sons, don't be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before Him and to serve Him, that you should minister unto Him and burn incense. Will you turn with me to 1 Peter 2, 9? Because I want to remind us this wasn't just about them. Aren't you glad that God doesn't make you, you know, burn frankincense before His altar every day, but actually He says that your kind of worship can be like daily living, for actually reading the Bible, actually sharing the gospel, doing things that are really truly profitable and wonderful? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. 1 Peter is close to the end of the Bible. You get almost to Revelation. You see the first John, you've gone too far. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of you. I to show forth my praises. Whose praises? His praises. The praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light you mean that the principles of all that he called the priest to are now applicable to me you're chosen all of those old testament things are actually for you in a measure obviously i we won't ask you to bring burn smoky flax in here in the church or little candles do that stuff but i want you to serve the lord i want you to show true devotion i want to be that person that comes to church that sits down to read my Bible, that opens up my life in prayer, that witnesses with the acknowledgement that it's not about me, that observes my morality and my, my conscience and all these things that come under God. That's how the church begins to experience true revival. And that's what changed the nation and changed the church, if you will. And with that, we're going to close in a word of prayer. This time, Terry, I'll dismiss you so you can get ready. We're going to have a baptism in just a moment. If with every head bowed and eyes closed... I want to have a time of reflection. I know it's been a long time, and, um, and you've been listening and listening and listening. But as um, oh, Terry, you're welcome to go uh, get changed if you're ready to prepare for the baptism here. Um, if you're listening right now, I want, to, I want to just encourage you. If you heard your problem, like if today, when I said worship has been about you, you went, uh, uh, yeah, that was me. You ask yourself this very carefully. Why am I following God? Why am I showing up at church? Why am I reading my Bible? Why am I praying? Are you doing this for you? I bet there's some Christians that need to confess. That need to say, you know what, God? I've been doing it for myself. I've got to ask this first question. Since God has a divine prerogative of how to be saved, God said, if you, want to, if you die today and you want to live forever, you need Jesus Christ, a faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's somebody here and they have not given God first place in their life. He's been drawing them, he's trying to get their attention, but they're not listening. And you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here that would like to give themselves a Jesus that would say, I believe, I'm submitting to God today. Is there anybody that needs to make that decision? You need to say, Lord, you're number one in my life. You get to decide what I believe through your word. You get to decide what's right and wrong. I don't get to decide. You get to decide what I do with my time. I'm encouraging you today, if you see a part of your life, a portion of your faith that you have taken for yourself, will you give it back to the Lord today? Will you say, Lord, it's yours. I'm doing this for you. 
I believe the reason that so many of us are discouraged in our ministries, in our work for God, in our daily tasks, in our teaching in the church, is because we are doing it for us. And we need to do it for God. And I hope the Lord speak into your life. And I hope you can respond now to that. I don't know what that looks like to you. As Brother Jim comes to play, I'll give you an opportunity and just give you just, just a minute to speak out of the Lord. If you identified an area of your life, will you please make a change?